Well, Dr. Lita, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Very grateful to be here. Oh, you're so sweet. Listen, we have so much ground to cover. I have so many questions for you and you are so fun to talk to. (laughs) I was like, we are not going to have a shortage of things to talk to. This will be a little bit different because um, we're going to be talking about the therapeutic use of psychedelics. Is it specifically psilocybin or are there other ones too that you? There are other ones that I I'm familiar with, you know, I've studied right. them. I've uh, you know, I've had some training in, in all of them really. Uh, okay. but psilocybin is the one that I like just because of the, the nature of it. It's so close to us and how we evolved. Yeah. Yeah. I I was just joking around with a friend. Um, We were talking about the different forms of psychedelic treatments and ayahuasca always comes up, but um, I don't like the idea of vomiting or shooting myself for, forgive me for, you know, (laughs) in the presence of other, (laughs) I mean, who who signs up for these things? But um, I get it that it's a spiritual experience and very healing in its own right. I know many people who have done that, but I'm really, so we're going to talk of, we're going to focus on psilocybin assisted therapies. Um, I'm very interested. I've seen Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. He has four episodes. The second one is specifically on psilocybin. And he talks about it in terms of people that are facing terminal illness and facing that existential crisis and the fear, wrestling with that fear of death that a lot of people have. But Mm -hmm. also um, in terms of addiction, I see everything through the lens of addiction. So that's why I wanted to talk to you and get your perspective about Really, I feel like this is addressing root cause. Is is that your experience that psilocybin addresses root cause? Absolutely. And I think, you know, all psychedelics do, um, um, if done correctly, if done yeah. in a way of, hey, I want to find root cause, because the intention of use is everything. Everything. Um, you know, if the intention is I want to run away from my problems, then you're gonna just use it as that, right? And you're going to keep going back to these retreats and not really gain what it is that you're looking for, for healing. Um, Now we have many, many people that do that. And the people who are looking for true healing, yes, root cause um, is is what I work on. And um, inevitably, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Gabor Mate's work, Dr. Mate. Oh, huge. Incredible, right? Don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Why the pain and and the trauma, where did that come from? And it doesn't have to be a huge, big macro trauma. It can be many minor micro traumas, you know, throughout the life of an individual that they perceived it as such. And there was not that attachment, the, you know, parental child bond and, you know, compassionate listening and connection. And so when I get into it with my clients, and I just work on conscious life practices that I developed through my own experience of burnout and depression, anxiety after I, I was a um, second year attending. Um, I'm still at the same institution. I'm a, a board certified academic hospitalist. So I take care of very sick patients in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, so after I'm going through my own burnout, now I see everybody from a lens of root cause of, oh, what is your trauma? Because every yeah. single one of my patients who are, you know, they are severely addicted to many substances. And I'm not talking just alcohol. Alcohol is huge in the state of New Mexico, huge. Um, in fact, we're t- twice the number of any other state. Wow. Uh, we're number one in, this, in the United States right now. Um, so what I see is really heartbreaking, you know, in the hospitalized patients. And you know, they're withdrawing from alcohol or they're dying from it because they're in uh, liver failure, cirrhosis and all of it. And, you know, as a physician to be able to also deal with the trauma of others, it's really important to deal with our own trauma. But there are very few people, few physicians who have dealt with their own trauma ever. They, a lot of them don't even know. And I didn't yeah. even know until I went through my own burnout. And so it was through my burnout and also, you know, my, um, I did a lot of research on psychedelic medicines. Um, I have a decade of experience with them, um, direct experience myself and also 
um, majority direct experience. And then, you know, in the more recent years, I take people to uh, countries where it is legalized, you know, for psilocybin specifically to hold retreats and help them become aware of their own trauma. And then we do a lot of work before and after, you know, I see that as a huge, huge, important, their cornerstones is pre-work, you know, so I do usually a few sessions of coaching. I'm a certified coach as well, um, executive and physician coach. And I coach anybody really, um, especially a lot of professionals just, you know, gravitate just because we understand each other, you know? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, holding that container of understanding, you know, where these traumas are coming from and implementing and rooting in life practices such as meditation, such as breath work, such as nature, you know, and these things sound simple, but in reality of doing them, they're not that easy for people to implement. Oh my gosh. I can't tell you how many times when I suggest to somebody, oh, you need to implement meditation. I, I met with so much resistance. I think it's the first time people try to sit quietly with their own feelings and it's unbearable. Right. Right. Yeah. Can we go back to um, a little bit? Can you describe what the pre-work looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So we do in my program, we do three to four sessions of coaching before you go to before like say go. Costa Rica for okay. yes, yeah. yes, beforehand. Be and and that is to even recognize, hey, is this individual, this being a wholesome being, are they ready? for the unveiling of what they may see. Um, And if, you know, it's, it's, it's always a, um, it's a dance, it's an interplay, you know, where they feel ready or they may not. Right. And we may just do coaching, you know, Mm -hmm. for eight to 12 sessions. Um, But if the individual does feel like, Hey, this is the right thing for me. I do all all kinds of screenings um, because you could have pre-existing conditions that puts you in harm's way using these medicines. And I'm, you know, being a physician, I think that just like, that's a very important thing for me. Um, Ethically, medically, scientifically, you know, knowing the research behind it um, also. What are some of the things you're screening for? And I'm asking because um, I have always heard that SSRIs, antidepressants are, I don't know if that's mutually exclusive, um, but that that could be problematic if you're doing psilocybin? Well, it depends on what you're, what the individual's taking. Um, it's not necessarily contraindicated. Um, what I've seen in practice is a lot of people, um, they wean off the patient um, until like about a week or five days before a high dose session um, and, you know, we have high dose session and we also have, you know, medium doses and then we have micro doses. Mm-hmm. Um, the high dose is where you do want to be off of your, your medications. I have had patients, you know, again, you know, who I've held space in legal settings, um, who have been on pretty, you know, uh, significant medications mm-hmm. and we've done, we've done that where, you know, a few days before I'd like it to get out of their system Mm -hmm. and then we go into it. And sometimes it's for them to um, experiment with microdosing to make sure that that is okay with them and with their body and with their being. It's like Mm -hmm. in harmony with them. Um, And psilocybin is one of them. We don't really see in research to have any side effects honestly, other than during the session, during research, what we've seen is maybe an elevated blood pressure and it comes down and is transient. Never anything that's lasted, you know. Now, the true contraindication that we're seeing in research is uh, people with bipolar disorders, bipolar one, bipolar two, if they have had any history of mania, manic Mm -hmm. episodes where they Mm -hmm. have sleepless nights where where they have pressured speech um and you know with bipolar you have these high high manic episodes where people are not sleeping for like three days um and then they have these huge dips into depression where for weeks they can't get out of bed then that's you know 
bipolar one bipolar two you have a lot more functional humans you know like jim carrey or you know a lot of our you know people actors and actresses they do have bipolar uh two who you know actually use that mania mm. episode to drive for forward you know even more <laughs> yeah. but then again it's it's something that is not included in the studies because of potential harm that it can cause to the individual is so they can was- a manic episode and not come out oh my gosh okay so um people need to be extremely cautious yes. if they have any kind of bipolar um, it sounds like if you're on um, an antidepressant, like an SSRI, then wean off. That that was one of the things that always concerned me. I have some, you know, people in my life that are considering it. And I know that they're on, you know, antidepressants. How long do you have to be, should you be off of them before you um, ingest psilocybin for a productive experience? You know, so what I'm going to tell you is not research-based. It's more anecdotal-based because there's just not a lot of information out there yet. Right, and yeah. that's why, you know, legalization of it will help us yeah. get this information, you know, sooner mm-hmm. than later. Uh, but from forums that I've been a part of, mm-hmm. um, I would say between five to seven days. Um, oh, okay, so not a long period of time. Not not a very long period of time. No. Now there are some medications like Effexor that are just difficult to get off of, and it takes a long uh, time okay. to taper off. And that's something to be talked to with either primary care or your psychiatrist, or right. you know, um, that hey, I'm considering this, and I know majority of doctors don't know about it, but it's becoming right. more common knowledge, and that's why. You know, I'm so passionate about talking in more, yeah. more and more forums about it because, and I wasn't until like about six months ago when I went to NBC and I had a um, educational session on the research behind, mm-hmm. you know, psychedelics that's coming out through the FDA, through Hopkins, yeah. Yale, NYU. Um, so but much research is coming out. So much research is coming out. But, you know, if one of your listeners is wanting more information, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, and maybe I can hook you up with the right person to answer the questions, or maybe I can answer the questions. Uh, yeah. But there is, um, I think there's more rise in awareness amongst the medical community about the, the research that's coming out also. Um, yeah, well, well, I'll definitely leave links to your, um, your website and how people can get a hold of you um, towards the end. Because I think those of us in the recovery community, it's, it's kind of a fine balance, because we all have sort of, I shouldn't say all, but there's a lot of us who are looking for that one thing that's going to fix us. Right. And I, and I know that this isn't a, you know, panacea that's going to fix all things for all people. But what I know for sure is that most people who suffer from addiction issues have an underlying, you know, uh, root cause like trauma uh, or, you know, childhood adverse experiences that um, are sort of the underpinnings of addiction. They say that alcohol is but a symptom of a deeper problem. So you know, once the addiction is kind of handled and the crisis, you know, averted, then I think it's a good time to start doing some of that deeper work. And that's where I feel like a lot of the people um, in long-term recovery, let's say, who've done a lot of work and are still struggling with those Mm -hmm. destructive patterns are looking to go deeper. And this sounds really interesting. So I like the, I, you know, I appreciate the cautionary tale for the people who are, um, you know, taking medications. Um, Let me give you one more cautionary and then I'm going to, I'm going to talk about addiction and psilocybin specifically. Okay. Um, If that's okay with you, please. Yeah. Um, So schizophrenia also is, is a, huge no-no if okay. it's in the either diagnosed in the patient or in family members with you know, like blood relatives okay. um, that that is part of the screening as well relatives, so, okay. because patient can go in psychosis and then what you know that'd be so, terrifying yeah terrifying it's terrifying yeah. yeah um so there's a lot of pre-screening yeah. And, and if before. there isn't, and if you reach out to somebody and they're like, oh, just come by and <laughs> you know, 
whatever. <laughs> going rogue. Yeah. Going That's, rogue. You know, don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do it. That's yeah, the first I mean, thing you stay away from. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't do it. Um, set and setting is crucial along with, <laughs> right. Along with intention, the mind is so powerful, you know, and, and people and motive, you know, in, in, you know, the 12 step rooms, we talk a lot about what is your motive. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, every, you know, those of us that are, you know, in the, I don't even know what to say in the rooms of recovery or on this path, we have to be so careful about what is your motive, yeah. You know, is this a, are you looking for a quick fix or is this really to address That's some beautiful. of that stuff that you just can't reach in sure. any other way, haven't been able to reach. Yeah. Um, okay. So the pre-work, so you do a lot of screening, you do some sessions to help mm -hmm. them answer the question. Are you ready? How do they come to that conclusion that they're ready how do they if know they're ready commitment and willingness yeah. to put in the work before we even talk about psilocybin so if if i determine that an individual sorry is the dog barking in the background bothering the session i can hear it yeah well yeah. will your puppy stop <laughs> it will stop if, if you give me a moment i will go, go ahead go ahead yeah let me see okay let me yeah because i don't know if they will. that's fine They get excited to defend the house. <laughs> so cute. I, I had to do that in an interview earlier in the week where um, I knew for sure my dog was going to pee on the carpet if I didn't let him out. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> I'm telling you, got to take care of the fur babies. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking about willingness and commitment. Yes. People have to be, uh, to, and you mentioned doing the work. What is the work? work. Can you define that? Yes, absolutely. So the conscious life practices, that is the foundational work for the coaching that I do is okay. the work. Okay. So if you are committed to yourself and you are committed to your intention and you're motivated to get to that life of freedom or whatever it is that you want to be living in or that mm -hmm. dream life of yours, then there has to be a very significant amount of commitment to yourself where there are no excuses. Like there's no excuse not to do a morning meditation, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There isn't. And we work on that. We work on that, you know? And of course, you know, I'm, I'm a fluid person. So when we are working and there is a resistance in, in one of the practices or, oh, you know, the morning time is this and that, then we get into whys, you know, what are the obstacles? Let's talk about that, you know? So we get through, and, and just by looking at the obstacles and what comes up for the individual, it's really cool that we are shaving off these layers and we're getting down to the root cause of things. It's so interesting. I just love that you said that we're shaving off these layers because that's like our essence is good, right? And you know, and, and sometimes that essence is wounded. You get a soul bruise. Right. And so we put up the, put up all this armor. And so we have to, I feel like recovery is more about taking away the things that no longer serve you, you know, yes. all this armor that we built up, it's a false identity. It's, you know, distance, isolation, just all these things that we do to stay safe. Like the, the, I think the core desire is to stay safe. Right. So we put on all this armor. So I love that idea that you said about like taking all that away. Yeah. Yeah. And so with this work is, you know, when you're committed to taking the, the layers off, then, then a lot comes out and it's so beautiful to, to watch the individual, you know, just change you in front of your eyes as the weeks go by. Mm -hmm. And that's really the indication of, okay, this person is, is ready. That's you know, right. or, or, or not, you know, or but not, like, oh, <laughs> or not. <laughs> and yeah, that's okay. okay too. Yeah. And that is okay too, because yeah. we all have our own timeline. We're all on our own journey. We all have to understand we're dealing with every individual is dealing with their own traumas. Right. And some are ready to 
move through, face them and really move through them. And some aren't, and that is okay. Um, I'm here to provide that safe container, no matter where I am with you. So, yeah. you know, whether it's the pre-work, whether the it's during holding the session or, you know, the post-work, it's all part of that container of, of love and understanding and teaching how to set boundaries for mm-hmm. yourself, for others, and, um, you know, continuing continuing this work, this commitment to yourself. Okay. I love that. But, okay. So it's the commitment to doing the work, the conscious life practices, like meditation is journaling a part of that. Journaling is a part of it. Body um, care. Body something. care is exercise is huge. Nutrition um, is huge. Hydration is huge. Um, I include cold therapy and heat therapy in that also. Um, I'm actually writing a book on all of this too, so that, oh, nice. it, you know, in their homes at their own, you know, leisure to study it and, and implement it into, into their own life. Um, sleep, sleep yes. is, is huge and we yeah. don't pay enough attention to, to it. Um, in fact, we should be prescribing these instead of medications and I do that in my practice too. You know, I, we, I do both. Sure. You know, I have to give medications because these patients come with 15 medications and everybody's different too. Everybody's different too. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I love the, the conscious life practices, everything that you mentioned, I'm, I'm super obsessed with because uh, in my mind, those are the things that it's a practice that a practice. Every, every day you choose, choose yeah. to do the work. Connection, connection. Oh is yeah. A huge one not only connection to self. So through all of these practices, you're connecting with yourself and in a different way, through a different lens. With Mm -hmm. meditation, you're connecting with yourself in a different way. Um, Seeing yourself, your thoughts, your, all of you in a different way. When you're drinking your water, you are holding that self-compassion of, "I'm, I'm clearing myself. There's fluid in me. There's fluidity in me. When you're choosing the food that you're eating consciously, you're connecting with yourself and you're saying, hey, do I want this or do I not? Or does how does this taste to me? You know, that conscious act of feeding your body, feeding yourselves, feeding your soul um, from all these different perspectives, body work. I love body work. You know, embodied work is there's just a million different ways you can go about it. You can do dance. You can do, you can dance with weights. You can just exercise. You can do interval training. You can run. You can um, do yoga or just do stretches in the morning. But doing them in the morning and having a morning routine is also a very important uh, part of all of this. I'm obsessed with morning routines. Yes, yes. Because you see the, the effect in your life. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. Okay, let's let's transition just a little bit to the actual experience. Is it a because I've I've heard a couple of things. Like if you're what do they call that? Psychedelic naive? Like if you've never had any, is that is that the term? Something about naive. Sure. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> We're fluid. Yeah. Okay. So if you've never done any psychedelics before, it, it's okay. I've heard a couple of things like you might want to try a low dose, right? Um, and then um, and then there's like maybe the second time a higher dose. They, I've heard it called a heroic dose. Yeah. So, you know, let me give some education on psilocybin if you don't okay. mind. Please. Yeah. We'll what is it? That. And yes. Yeah. So psilocybin is a psychoactive compound in over 200 different types of mushrooms. Okay. We commonly hear it as uh, magic mushrooms. Absolutely. You can okay. call it magic <laughs> mushrooms. But what's fascinating is that it's in, in 200 plus different wow. species of mushrooms found around the world. And we find more and more, you know, over time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Psilocybin is not an addictive substance. Thank people. you for saying that. Yeah, it's not yes, addictive. It yeah. is non addictive. Mm-hmm. Ketamine can be addictive, but mm, psilocybin yeah. is literally it's anti addictive. Um, okay. And that's what's really cool when you're using it with people who have had addiction experience. And in fact, we just had a recent study come out 
with um, in, in a group of alcoholics in New Mexico, where we have a huge addiction problem, not only with alcohol, but polysubstance mm-hmm. use disorder is huge here. Um, and we don't have resources to help these people, unfortunately. But it was a 32-week study. At um, they, they started with um, intense psychotherapy. At week four, they gave these individuals psilocybin high dose. And I'll get into what that means. Okay. Um, and then the other group got Benadryl. And then the uh, four weeks after, at, wait, eight, at eight weeks, they did the same thing. Mm-hmm. High dose psilocybin and Benadryl to to the other group. The Benadryl group had about a 10% reduction in in outcomes of drinking at 32 weeks. But they had also received intense psychotherapy, just like the psilocybin group. Both got the same psychotherapy. The psilocybin group had an 80% reduction in drinking outcomes. And they, in fact, didn't want to even touch alcohol wow. after two sessions. And they were four weeks apart. And they were high dose. And what do I mean by high dose? So the dose range is 100 to 120 micrograms is a micro dose. So micrograms for micro dose. And with that, the individual usually feels elevated, Mm -hmm. you know, and everything's more bright and more beautiful and you're more engaged with your life, but you don't really feel it much. And just everybody knows everyone's dose is different. That's why this work is so important to have a guide, to have a professional guide who knows what they're doing, who can Mm -hmm. tell you, hey, Maybe even the 120 microgram is too much for you. Maybe you need just 60 microgram, or maybe you need double that to see, you know, how that works for you. Mm -hmm. In the community, we see, and again, there is not a lot of research on microdosing at all. There's a database that they're collecting, but there isn't like a lot of research coming out yet. It's going to come out very soon. Research in terms of peer reviewed journal papers? Yes. Yes. Okay. Like from cell where there's three of them, oh, cell science right. or, or from like, you know, uh, psychology, um, okay. um, or from JAMA or from, you know, these like yeah. reputable, um, sources in yeah. met that we look in medicine usually, you know? Right. Right. Um, but I do know that there are websites like Paul Stamets is collecting data on thousands of people who are using microdosing just he's collecting data. And I'm sure soon he's going to come out with, you know, more of a guideline of like what works for people, you know, is he part of the maps organization, the multidisciplinary discipline? Yeah. Yeah. I think he's so Paul Stamets is uh, the most well-renowned mycologist Mm. um, that also does work for the government. And he's the one that has um, identified many of the new mushrooms that we know of today. Okay. Um, so he's a wealth of knowledge. He's, he's awesome. He's okay, awesome. I'll, he's I'll put a link to him in the show notes. Do you yeah, yeah, spell yeah, his yeah. last name? Great. Paul Stamets, S-T-A-M-E-T-S. Oh, I was so close. <laughs> I said I-T-S. I can't spell the same I like. Okay. Yeah. Paul okay. I'll put, I'll, I'll find some resources for him and put it put it in the show notes as well. Awesome. So that's microdosing. I use medium dosing, like one gram or maybe two grams where you definitely feel the medicine. And that's gram. That's not micro anymore. Yeah. That's not micro anymore. So if the individual is choosing to do a gram, have the day off. (laughs) (laughs) Don't go to work that day. (laughs) Depending on what you do. (laughs) <laughs> exactly but you know, it's, it's good not to have appointments and gotta take <laughs> and doing all those things if you're a dentist don't, go to, dentist, work. don't go to work <laughs> if your doctors don't do it you know like if you know it just depends if you're staying at home and you know it's you want a chill day you want a chill yeah. day 
if you're an um, artist, uh, you might want to go to work. If you're yes, an artist, you might you're want an to artist, go to work. It's, it's your day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm trying to be serious. Okay. Okay. No, so love- one to two grams is medium. Don't go to work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, anytime if you are interested, even because I know a lot of people in the community, though, it's a controlled substance, like schedule one, you know, where you can still get arrested if, you know, they find that you have it on you. So right. people need to know about that. It's still yeah. illegal, you know, other than in Oregon, in Colorado, I think it just got legalized in San Francisco, they're decriminalizing or they did already. And I'm sure the rest of California is going to f- follow suit mm-hmm. and New Mexico is up next. And then there's a couple of states in the Northeastern states that um, are about to legalize or maybe decriminalize. So be aware of the legalities because nobody wants to go to jail. That sucks. And it's, <laughs> you know, obviously we know this is like, this is a very natural compound found in like forests, right? Yeah. Um, but just be aware of that. And where I come in is like education. Education is so important because if you are going to partake and it is, you know, a lot of people are sending it out to friends across the country and it's happening and that's okay. It's important for us to talk about it and, and, and educate each other on it. You yeah. Know? I, I feel like we're on the forefront at this point. There's, you know, even though there's been so many studies, uh, Dr. Roland Griffiths is pretty big in the uh, psilocybin psychopharmacology. Huge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I Huge. heard somewhere that he had some 300 peer reviewed journal papers yep. published that were some of them that are, that are like 30 years old because they started this work before, um, right. the, the uh, government, um, started, to. Uh, classifying it as a schedule one, but, um, and I love that there are some clinical trials at Johns Hopkins NYU that you were talking about. And also compass, I believe is in third phase clinical trials. And I'm hearing it's supposed to be, um, approved for medicinal use in Oregon this summer. Yes, I think so. Yeah. That's really exciting. It's very exciting. And that's why, like, we just need to know if we are encountered with this opportunity, how are we going to proceed? You know, very careful. Are we yeah. like, what are the dosages? Like, who do I do this within? What setting do I do it with? And then, you know, the high dose is three grams and up is high dose. And that can be the hero's, you know, three to five grams, grams. can be the hero's dose, or you can go on a hero's journey, which is you no, know, you have to be very conscious of what you're about to do. Yeah. And you have to be very safe about it with the people that you're with. You have to be in with safe people that you know, you care about, they care about you. There's love there. They're, they will hold a beautiful space for you if they're not professionals. Like, Sentence and if you have professionals, that's really where you want to go. You want professionals to do this work for you with you because the professional is going to be there and tend to your needs as Mm -hmm. you are in this metaphysical space Mm -hmm. where your physical body is not able to do the things that it usually can do Mm -hmm. so you need people who can hold you through it that hold a container of compassion and love and they have to be trained in what they're doing so um, what, what is the, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, um, I know immediately everyone's going to say, well, what, or what, how will they intercede if someone gets in trouble? Like if, how will they know? Because I hear it. I mean, we're not talking necessarily about a pleasant experience always. Right. No, it's, no. I hear that you need to surrender to yes whatever comes up, like surrender yes. is a big part. Like you're facing the demons or the things that you've locked away in your mind. Right. You know, like your mind has a way of protecting you and has mechanisms to protect you from traumatic um, experiences and the psilocybin sort of melts those walls and kind of lets sets the beast free, so right. to speak. So, um, if somebody gets into a, a place where they're really afraid, how does the professional intercede or guide the experience? You know, the the that this is why the pre work is so important, right? Because the pre work teaches you those anchors. 
Oh. So during the, the ceremony, I will direct them, hey, get into your breathing. Mm. Just pay it. It's your breath is the only thing that exists in this moment. Mm -hmm. And they get into their breathing. Or we have done heart work. So get into your heart. Mm -hmm. Go hug that little, you know, kid. Mm -hmm. and, and tell her she's loved. And that she's safe. And that she's going to be okay. And she is okay. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's why the pre-work is so important. I feel like reaching that inner child is so hard sometimes because, you know, those of us who've experienced trauma have disassociated so hard that like, we don't even feel it yeah. and it's tough to get to. It can be yes. tough to get to even with years of practice. Yes. So, yeah. um, so this gets you right there. <laughs> so beautiful. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, um, I hear that for self forgiveness and spirituality, like those are kind of a, two of the sort of common experiences I hear. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of people experiencing self forgiveness? Yeah, you know, that's, again, you know, that's where the guide comes in. So is, is so the role of the guide is so important. Um, it just depends on what the individual is going through, and how mm -hmm. you're going to keep bringing them back to self compassion, yeah, and holding them in, in that compassionate container, that container of love, and security, because majority of people, major, everybody who's gone through trauma, it's traumatic because you feel detached, because you feel insecure, because you feel unsafe, because you feel like there's no love. You know, those mm -hmm. are some of the common things that we know in trauma work. Mm -hmm. And so bringing the individual back to their heart, whatever comes up, you know, I've held space for elder parents who are like, I fucked up with my kids. Yeah you know, and the guilt that comes with that. And like, no, keep going back to love because you did the best you could do in that moment with what you had. Absolutely. You had no one around. You were isolated. You were a single mom from a different country. You had no one have. So you keep bringing them back to the heart. Like, okay. and, and that may take more work afterwards Later. yeah the, yeah we'll talk about the integration piece yeah. um I think it's so interesting about the self-forgiveness part I know you know immediately I was like uh-oh if I tried this are all my secrets going to come out <laughs> like, uh -oh. only to yourself <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to suddenly confess like my deepest darkest no if, no. if you want to you can <laughs> <laughs> you must hear some weird shit. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> I do. But yeah. I hold it with love and I I, yeah. I you know, it's interesting because some people actually want me to record them. Yeah. Cause they want to go back as part of their integration to listen to what came up and why, you know, because you do forget, you know, some of yeah. the, some of it, you, you can forget afterwards. Like the insights, like you yeah, have like a profound like insight profound. during the, like, and then you forget. You can, yeah. but some of them, you literally change at a cellular level because you're experiencing, it's a direct experience. That's what it does differently than psychotherapy, but that's why the oh. manager of the two is so beautiful. Psychotherapy yeah. This is this type talk therapy, and you're out here talking about it. With psychedelics, you go inward and mm -hmm. you're experiencing it. And we know that there's nothing like that lived experience. Yeah. Right? I always joke around like, you can explain an orgasm to somebody but until you <laughs> have you. one, it's an entirely different experience. <laughs> Earth-shattering. I'm going to use that next time. <laughs> no, it's not funny. Terrible example, but it's everyone gets truth. it. No, it's a everyone it's, gets it's it. Perfect. It's beautiful. <laughs> so funny. Okay, so good to know that you're not going to confess your worst sins and <laughs> no, only you know them. <laughs> only you, even amazing. if it feels like it, you, only you know them, and that's what you have to be with trusted people. Right. Because let's say your your darkest things and you want to talk about them. 
you got to be with a professional okay. who will hold that completely not and they're trained in being completely non-judgmental and observing ah i'm here to observe i'm here to hold space yeah. for you and that's it that's my yeah. role and i will light the candles for you to walk the path that it, it's not as scary because it's uncharted territory when you know for a psychedelic naive individual it's uncharted territory. But if you have had an individual who's gone through it, it's a professional who's done it for a long time Mm -hmm. and has had experience, then you know, like, okay, you're going to be fine. I'm holding you. It's going to be okay. And it's those reminders of the words, right? Surrender. Mm -hmm. Man, that is a word that has come up. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that has come up for me over and over again. I sent a, a book draft to a publisher and after the discussion, she was just like, just surrender, <laughs> surrender to the process. <laughs> I'm going to do that with my book too. I'm going to. Yeah, super, we'll, yeah, we'll talk. Wait, it, that. It's so interesting. The, uh, you know, the title, you know, the roller coaster, the highs and the lows of any time you're trying something new or an endeavor, it's, it's good to have you know, somebody that can hold space and keep you grounded within the boundaries. Okay. So lots of surrender. I know people are listening, being like, what kind of secrets does Arlena still have? I know, right? (laughs) After all this time, (laughs) I will say that I have, there's that saying that you don't have to tell everything to everybody, but you got to tell everything to at least somebody. I like that. Yes. Yeah. 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 You yeah. got to open that no, pressure no, cooker. Yeah. You know? I, have no, I have no secrets. Um, okay. So the forgiveness comes when we are able to express the things that we have guilt and shame about. And it's so important for that guy. It sounds like holding um, or being redirected back to the self compassion. And providing that security is, you know, crucial to the experience to move through that. Um, And then we were talking about, it was self-forgiveness and is there, so talk to me a little bit about the change in self-identity, because it's my understanding that, you know, our ego develops like a identity and we sort of hide behind this identity and does the psilocybin experience help reframe, like help you to, you know, drop the scales, drop the armor and and reveal your true identity. How does that work? Big time, big time. So in the brain studies, fMRIs that we look at, functional MRIs that we look at the brain, we look at, we see a lot more brain cohesion and that is the, and a lot more connectivity. If you look at these pictures, it's really cool. There's a lot more connectivity between different areas of the brain um, compared to not being on psilocybin. So on a daily routine of life, we get used to certain comforts, certain conditioning, certain ways of being, and those are our comfort zones. And the default mode network is kind of like a central part of in the brain where it kind of, you know, it's like a traffic circle of, Hey, you go this way, you go that way. Um, and the brain coherence is not seen as much. It's like one part lights up, the other part lights up. And what, once you are using psilocybin, all of that goes away. And that's Amazing. where we see the ego dissolution in the psychological terms, which is so cool because like we have the brain imaging and then we have the uh, right. psyche, you know, now we're matching it up and seeing what does this mean on a physiological level and on an mm-hmm. anatomical level? It's so mm-hmm. cool. Um, so the, I'm, a geek, the- I'm a total geek, but yeah. Listen, I love it. We can geek out all day. The um, disillusionment of the ego, does that only happen at the heroic dose, the high level of three to five grams? It, it, you know, it's it's more effective. It, it, yes, more yeah. likely to happen in the higher doses. Yeah. Um, but it depends. Yeah, it depends on the individual too, like, and what they're looking for. Okay. But in the in the higher dose range, you just cannot hold the armor anymore. I know. Some you of know? us, you got to slap it out of your hand. That's what happens. It's Drop like, it. Let's Drop it. Talk, it's done. Talk with a ball. And, and that's, you know, those are the moments that like you can get scared, but it's like you yeah. surrender into that. You're like, oh, this is not scary. This is just yeah. me being me with clarity without my anxiety, 
without these, right? Without these past patterns of wanting to please others, without these past patterns of whatever it is, you know, that we're holding. Yeah, like a lot of us struggle with things like I talk to a lot of people that are like me that's like total workaholic or achievement yeah. oriented or, you know, hide hiding behind um you know, validation through achievement, all that, all that kind of stuff, which leads to the the burnout that you were talking about before. Right. And so I think that's so important to this idea of changing your default mode network. Your, I think of it as like your brain's operating system that's established in childhood. And it's very hard to change that by the way, very hard to change that. but I, I like the idea of, um, you know, slapping the stack of books out of someone's hands, like, (laughs) you know, so funny. Um, I also hear that spirituality or the mystical experience is a very common component of this experience. Can you tell me a little bit about why that's important or maybe some of the experiences that you've seen as you've guided other people through this? I think one of the most prominent one that comes out is the connectivity to the collective. You feel one and you, it's a lived experience. It's now in your cells and in your DNA that you know, if my fellow human being, fellow plants, fellow, you know, animals, (laughs) other animals are hurting, then I'm hurting too. And if I'm well, and I, if I work on me, then I'm changing the world also, not by being out there all the time and trying to change the world, but by changing me from inside out is, you you know it, it's just a knowing that comes. And then there are other knowings that come with it, just because all of, you know, your defense mechanisms, all of that is gone. Um, and, you know, sometimes that happens in the subsequent sessions. Um, mm. I don't hold sessions for anybody closer than three months, you know, um, to each oh, other. Oh, so you, so you do it once and then three months later. In perhaps- case, if the patient, if the person still has the feeling that they still have stuff work that they need to work. More work through. to be done, yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, a lot of people that start this work, they're like, oh my God, they do the first session. They're like, this is just the beginning. I you know. know, and, and it, and I understand, do you know? Um, and then there's different modalities that you can use to, to get to the bottom of it, but still seven being the most gentle and again, non-addictive mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, where was I, we were talking about different modalities of dissolving the defensiveness yeah, and yeah, getting yeah, to yeah. the spirituality, so there, right. Spirituality. Yeah. You know, it's, tough for me to tease out and separate it out explaining spirituality because I've it's so interwoven in my life it's experiential it's experiential and it's um you know I was talking to Dr. Strassman who was the first clinical psychiatrist in the world to do studies on human subjects using DMT and he was doing it at my institution in in the 1990s using federal government money And I have him actually on my podcast talking about this. He says, if you want to have a spiritual experience, you have to live spiritual life. (laughs) And everyone's like, what does that mean? (laughs) Yeah. And so that's why I, you know, when I'm doing my work with the pre-work, yeah. We talk about spirituality. We we even read, you know, spiritual books, whatever that means to the individual. For yeah, me, and I, I want to differentiate spirituality from religion. Please. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. It's so it's a uh, it's different. It's just different. different. You say that uh, religion is for people who are trying to stay out of hell, and spirituality is for <laughs> people who've been there. <laughs> Been there. I love yeah, it. So. Yeah. All the rooms, all the addicts, recovering addicts, they're like, yeah, I guess that. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Some people, people are gonna get so mad mocking religion, but it's just you know anyway, everybody has to kind of come to their own terms with you all know, that. yeah. Let me tell you, I lived in a religious theocracy for the first 14 years of my life. Oh, you're from Iran. Iran. Yeah, you know what's happening. Iran. Sorry, have you yeah. heard? Oh yeah. Oh my it's gosh. Yeah. Woman it's life over. freedom revolution oh my gosh. happening. And that's what I lived under. And 
when you marry religion and state, it's a disaster. It's anti-human. Disaster. Don't disaster. do it. It's anti-human. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Ooh, it's like, yeah. don't do it. Now, there I, have- I say amen to that. <laughs> amen to that. <laughs> all All of that said too i know people who are religious and use religious texts for their own spirituality in a beautiful way yes in a beautiful beautiful you know just don't force it upon each other don't put it into politics like stop it with that you know stop it one of the things that speaks to me especially because of my culture is rumi oh yeah rumi rumi poets oh I have a friend who named his dog Rumi. Yes. (laughs) Oh, good. Okay. So the Rumi poets, I'm going to have to like leave some links in the show notes for resources because the Rumi poets are so beautiful. So Is that, is Rumi, I'm sorry. I just realized, is Rumi a single person or is it a? Rumi is a single person. Okay. So So it's it's not like, okay. Rumi poems, not poets. Got it. Yes, Rumi poems. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Iran has many different poets who have just, you know, I, I think psychedelics, specific, specifically psilocybin, was a really big part of my culture. I did not know that. That's yeah. amazing. Ancient culture of Zoroastrians. Yeah. And when I read the the poetry from my my country and my ancestry, it is the most psychedelic thing ever like Rumi you read Rumi and his poems are psychedelic now it all makes sense it makes so much sense and so if you want to get into that kind of spirituality where it is in line with um psilocybin and the psilocybin journey like that's the the perfect thing too I had no idea that's amazing yeah do you want to hear something funny is uh the founder uh one of the co-founders of the 12-step program um did LSD and then wrote the 12. He wanted to make uh, psychedelics part of the program. Right. So I'm, gonna, I'm making all kinds of people mad today. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. But I think it's, it's true. Important. Yeah. It's, I think it's part important. of history. It's, it's part, part of history. history. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. guess what? He, he came to 12 steps probably as a big part to psychedelics. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, religion, we're now looking at records it started because of psychedelics, you know? So we're ta- looking at these prophets that most likely and almost like with certainty, they use psychedelics to have the scriptures that they wrote and the message that they gave to people that was so beautiful, you they know? Were channeling, yeah. You they wanna were- hear something funny is Joel Osteen is a famous Christian preacher whom oh. I love actually. And he was quoted as uh, people, some, somebody was uh, recording him and asking him about manna from heaven. And he's like, well, it's some, some people think that it's uh, magic mushrooms <laughs> and there's some ancient, yeah, there's some ancient um, yeah. artifacts, artwork where these uh, religious leaders are standing next to really tall things. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, they, they say that those are probably mushrooms. Yes. How interesting, right? Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. It makes sense. And we just kind of sweep that under the rug. Let's whitewash yeah. it. But it's also control, right? Like religion. Oh, came right. Yeah. And then it wasn't the people who, like the prophets necessarily, who said don't use. It was the people the that came after used, you know, they're like, oh, now these teachings are gold. Like now we can control people with fear and and preach don't use because if they do, they're going to have open minds and come up with like more things that are going to overpower us you know it's a it's a game with humanity unfortunately and yeah it's a humanity and religion but right wow we went into some deep waters there (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) okay so yeah spirituality is a very complex and can be heated conversation but i think the essence of what i want to share is from what i've heard and i would love your confirmation on this that it is a true form of spirituality in the sense that it's about connectedness and love. Is that fair? Absolutely. That's so fair. (laughs) (laughs) And it's this path of self-discovery. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I believe spirituality to be a path of self-discovery and um, we're all on that path, especially, you know, the listeners on your podcast um, having had 
their own difficulties and challenges in life and seeing that as like the greatest gift to yeah. you as a as you know as someone who's gone through all of this and you continue to evolve and we all do we're yeah. all continuing to evolve um and and it's it's one step at a time every day and we're just there's no destination you know um and this is what it also shows you it's like hey there's no destination just keep taking oh. steps and enjoying it enjoy life I lo- just to dive deeper on the there is no destination um I recently went to I was last year I went to a she recovers event and Nadia Wells Bowles I think I'm not sure if I'm getting her name right I'll look it up and put it but um she was one of the speakers and she was talking about giving up the idea of the perfect future self or a version of your future self that it's like it's almost can be like it's an ideal that we beat ourselves up over yeah right and to just let it go and be right here right now and love this version of you yes right and and just like that self-acceptance and I love that it seems so healing right it is it is yeah. yeah, the self-discovery that you're actually, I think the discovery is that, oh, you're actually okay. You're actually okay. <laughs> and you know, uh, to your point, um, that spiritual side of psychedelics or psilocybin also comes when you are present. You're mm-hmm. infinitely present. You can't not be present. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, again, that direct experience of like, I can't not be anywhere else. I'm here. And yet I'm connected with everything and everyone. Um, and that's a really interesting thing because, you know, in, in our regular life, it, it, you have to keep practicing it. Right. And in that state, it's, you just are. You just are. So it sort of gives you uh, an experience that after the experience is over, you sort of can recognize it. Like in meditation, you can recognize it when it's, when you're fully present. Yes. And you can always connect yourself back to, back to it. You can always connect yourself back to it and bring that to your life, that integration piece. You can always go back to it and keep bringing it back into your life. And that's where the magic lies. How mm. am I going to bring the magic that I just learned about myself and, and connect it with this life here and now with the way I interact with other individuals, with the way I connect with my 14 year old, with my two year old, with my husband, with my patients, with my, the world around me, with my, with our planet, how am I, you know, connect with my plants at home. Um, and that's the integrative work that is so important. It's really, you know, a big part of the journey is really that is, is integration afterwards integration afterwards. That was a perfect segue. That's what I wanted to talk about next. And so, um, in your coaching practice, you have a, so the entire process includes afterwards and the integration. Um, what are some of the experiences like for those that you're guiding through this process in the integration phase or are they changing, are they releasing relationships that no longer work for them or, discovering a new job purpose or what does that look like for them on the other side? Yeah. It's interesting. You ask is everyone is so different yeah. and it can be a combination of all of that, all you know? That, yeah. um, and, you know, a lot of it is just recognition of what can I do differently? You know, what can I do differently that serves me? And it's, it's a very cool thing. People recognize that as you said, these are things that don't serve me. Mm -hmm. I don't need them in my life. Could that be a job? Could that that be a toxic work environment, toxic relationship? Sure. Or could it be, hey, I need to work on myself first and then determine if this is toxic or I was bringing the toxicity. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. Is it me? Am I the asshole? Is it me or is it, is it them? Is it you know, <laughs> that is so important. That is so funny, but that is so important. Is it me? <laughs> Am I the drama? Am I the drama? Because <laughs> it's interesting when you when you really work on yourself. It's like all of these energetic um, tangles that you've had yeah. forever, right? For like fifty years. Now they're releasing. And it feels uncomfortable a little bit. And you're like, I don't know what to do with this. So when you talk about it, then you can 
tell, you know, you can take back people to their authentic selves because you've been watching them without judgments. Because right, right, right. people, they judge themselves so much. You oh know, they're like, gosh. oh my God, like, is it, you know, even that blame part, like, is it me? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's things that you've carried Depends. through forever with yeah. you and maybe even intergenerationally. And, you know, there's a saying, and I, you know, this is not, no way to prove this, but they say, when you untangle those traumas of the past, you are untangling for seven generations before you and seven generations after you. Mm-hmm. And that's so beautiful to think about and to just like sit with that and contemplate because the work that I've done for myself through my own burnout, what I've seen is my life changing in a completely different direction with my own family. And the mm-hmm. work was me. Like I was not holding necessarily my husband and he needed to evolve with me or it wouldn't have worked mm-hmm. you know yeah one cannot sta- stay stagnant and the other one's like shooting up to the stars you know <laughs> it can't like I've gone through that too I've had a divorce yeah. there you know because of it okay. but um it's really the work that I've individually done on me and the integration that I've done on myself that I've recognized okay this doesn't belong to me. This isn't even my thought. This was a thought that right. was implanted in me right. by generations before me, yeah. by the culture I grew up with, like the um, sacrificial giving, you know? Oh. My gosh, right? And the sacrificial giving. I mean, that's every mother's lot, isn't it? Guilt and <laughs> sacrifice. Yes, yes. <laughs> the guilt and the sacrifice. Um, no, that's, that's, I mean, I've, I've been hearing studies about the intergenerational trauma that is passed down and there's all the, always this beautiful hope that maybe I'm, this is the generation that'll, that'll break the cycle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I love this type of the potential of possibly, you know, maybe we can be the generation. Maybe we don't have to pass it down to our kids. Right. Maybe they don't have to pass it down to theirs. Right. So yeah. 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 There's, there's a lot to that. Yeah. Um, my goodness, I could talk to you all day. Um, maybe we'll have to do a round two after because it's okay. So, but I do want to mention that you are going to be facilitating a group in Costa Rica in the spring. It sounds like the dates are still fluid, but if people are interested in reaching out to you, what's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, contact me through my my website, uh-huh. Dr. family because we're all family. <laughs> I love that. That's <laughs> so see, sweet. Up top, you'll see a little link for um, sign me up for the newsletter. Um, okay, newsletter. You know, put your email in that so that you're part of the list. Okay. And let me tell you, I'm not a big newsletter fan myself because I get so many of them and I cannot keep up. So <laughs> if even if I do send out, it's like once a month okay. to keep the community going and to keep yeah. the community informed of the happenings that may be coming up. Okay. Um, I also have a podcast that you can check out. Oh, that's right. Conscious- Tell me the name of the podcast. Sure. It's Conscious Physician. And subtitle is medicine and psychedelics. Ooh, so good. Yeah. I'm really excited. You know, um, I'm really excited about the potential for healing because the psychopharmacology uh, arena, the psychiatrists and stuff have, haven't had many new tools in a very long time. Ever. Forever. Ever. And it's mostly the tools that we have are about managing the issue oh, yeah. not resolving and i'm really super hyper focused on resolving root root cause yes and you know as a doctor let me tell you that's where a lot of our burnout comes in yeah. because i have patients on five different antidepressants on mm-hmm. anxiolytics like benzos and this and that which are absolutely harmful mm-hmm. and they're not getting anywhere not and then they resort to substances because they just can't anymore yeah, or you so know they sad. become suicidal so for me, this is very exciting to see people really change their life with like one or two sessions of psilocybin. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Plus psychotherapy. Plus, plus psychotherapy. Psych- but they're getting off of antidepressants that they've been on yes. in some cases decades. Yeah. And and so some are coming off completely. Some are coming off some of them. 
Okay. As long, you know, and that's that's great, but their life has changed in every case that I've ah, seen. Every yeah. case, yeah. In every case that I've seen. It's amazing. <laughs> well, this is really exciting territory. It's a it's a new frontier. I'm so excited that we're, you know, we're headed in this direction. Um, we need better tools to help treat yeah. addiction at, at the root cause. And I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what's, what's coming for us. And um, I appreciate all the education that you're providing and the, and the thank services, because it's going to be desperately needed for Thank you for so many much people. for having me and listening. Yeah. And- <laughs> <laughs> it's <was> fun. <laughs> so fun. I knew you were going to have a good time. Well, listen, I'll leave all the links to all your contact information in the show notes. But again, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much.